You can get the next episode of Sworn right now on the TuneIn app. On TuneIn, new episodes of Sworn are available one week early. Download TuneIn today and listen for free. Place your left hand on the Bay of Bible and raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. We the jury find the defendant not guilty. Protests continued this weekend in Ferguson and around the country. We're resisting. You're un- no, you're it makes no sense. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Judge, you are the last line of reason in this case. Every one of us took an oath of office and we're sworn to uphold the Constitution. From Tenderfoot TV in Atlanta, this is Sworn. I'm your host, Philip Holloway. Last weekend, I stayed in a hotel and it really reminded me why I really, really love my sleep number bed at home because I couldn't wait to get back in my own bed, my sleep number 360. My sleep number setting is 55 and my sleep IQ score last night was 97. Now my friends at sleep number have introduced the most amazing bed ever. It's the one I have. It's the new sleep number 360 smart bed. It's designed to keep each of you effortlessly comfortable for your best possible sleep. Sleep Sleep Number 360 beds let you choose your ideal firmness and support on each side of the bed so you stay sleeping comfortably throughout the night. Did you also know Sleep Number beds cost about the same as a traditional mattress, but they last twice as long? It's time that you met the bed that does it all only at a Sleep Number store. Come in now and enjoy introductory savings of two to $400 on the Sleep Number 360 bed, plus ask about their 48-month financing. There are more than 550 Sleep Number stores nationwide. Visit sleepnumber.com to find the store nearest you. And please be sure to tell them that Philip Holloway from the Sworn Podcast sent you. On this episode of Closing Statements, Phil talks to one of Deborah Weidman's family members who reached out to him after the first three episodes were released. But first, we'll hear Jason Walker's perspective. To recap, Jason Walker was the alleged father of Melissa's baby, someone who seemed to have a potential motive at the time. He agreed to talk to us about his experience, but he didn't want his voice to be used. I'll be reading the questions that we asked Jason, and Phil will voice his responses. What was your life like in Turner County in 2002? Where did you live? What was your job? I lived in the northern part of the county, worked on a decent-sized farm in South Crisp County. I enjoyed the work and who I worked for. No complaints. What was your relationship with Melissa like? Someone mentioned to us that you may have been married at the time you were seeing Melissa. Is that right? Or were you exclusively with Melissa at the time? I was not married at the time of the incident. It's no secret that our relationship started when I was married. We continued after I divorced. I'll not dispute that there were ups and downs. It's no secret. You probably know that. What was your relationship with TJ and Deborah like? Her parents treated me very well, even at times when maybe they shouldn't have. They welcomed me in their home and never made me feel like they didn't want me there. We even went on an out-of-town trip or two. What was your alibi that night? We heard from a credible source that your car hood was cold that morning and that you couldn't have left your house in that car. Could you tell us the same alibi you told the police? If my old age memory serves me right, we had gone to Cordial Walmart for some things and then stopped to see a couple of guys at the GSP post when it was still on Midway Road. Then when I went home... I was home until I was notified of the fire. When I was notified, I rode with someone to the house. Did you feel like you're the only person of interest in that case or that there was too much focus on you? How did the investigation impact your personal life within Turner County? What about your professional life? I don't think I was the only suspect. Of course, in the situation, I was the first one that came to their minds. The second part of that question, I can't really answer because I don't know how much anyone else was questioned. Third part, You know, things like this will obviously make people wonder. I've maintained my innocence the whole time and still do. Very, very few ever treated me different. What do you think could have been done differently in the investigation process in order to find the person or people that did this? And, as you said, bring relief to those of you who were wrongly accused. I can't really answer this because I only know what they did when they questioned me. I allowed a search of my home and my car without them having a warrant. I had no reason to interfere or make it hard on them. I know slash knew several of the guys that were on the case at the time. They were doing their job, and we remain good friends today. Again, though, 
I can only answer about how I was questioned, not anyone else. Who else do you think was wrongly accused, along with you? I can only speak for me. I know I was wrongly accused, and I really don't know who was questioned or in what manner. Do you think there are still people in Turner County that think you had something to do with the incident? Until it's solved, I'm sure there are, but I don't think I'm the only one people suspect, but can't speak for anyone else either. I guess the media could only report on what they were told by law enforcement. I don't think they tried to push an opinion, only what they were given. How do you think the media handled the case? I guess the media could only report on what they were told by law enforcement. I don't think they tried to push an opinion, only told what they were given. Finally, Jason says, I hope that helps you. I hope what you are doing finds the missing piece or that one person that knows what happened. We both know that someone knows what happened, and it's long overdue that the truth be told. Thanks for reaching out to me, and I hope what I've told you helps. Good luck with getting others to reply back to you. hate clothes buying as much as I do? Do you hate going to the store and having to deal with the crowds and all that stuff? Well, listen, there's a better way to do it, folks. It's called Mack Weldon. If you're a guy or someone who needs to purchase clothing for a guy, Mack Weldon is what you need to check out. This is really the best stuff I have in terms of underwear, t-shirts, and socks, and things like that. Mack Weldon believes in smart design, premium fabrics, and simple shopping. Mack Weldon will be the most comfortable underwear, socks, shirts, undershirts, hoodies, and sweatpants that you will ever wear. They have a line of silver underwear and shirts that are naturally antimicrobial, which means they eliminate odor, folks. They want you to be comfortable, so if you don't like your first pair, you can keep it, and they will still refund you, no questions asked. Not only does the underwear, socks, and shirts from Mack Weldon look good, they perform well, too. It's good for working out, going to work, going out on dates, just everyday life. It's perfect. Go to MacWeldon.com and get 20% off using promo code SWORN. That's MacWeldon.com. Get 20% off using promo code SWORN. David Wheeler, one of Deborah's younger brothers, reached out to Phil after the first three episodes aired. He wanted to talk to us. He said he had something to share, so Phil called him back. David, can you please tell us what your name is and how you're connected to this case? I am David Wheeler. I am the younger brother of Deborah Weidman. Deborah and and Tommy Joe and Melissa were part of my family. Where do you live? I live in Sycamore, Georgia, about a mile or two from the Tiff County line and about five miles from from Mashburn, Georgia, and about 12 miles from Rebecca, where they lived. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about your sister and her family, the people that lost their lives. What can you tell us about them? They were very friendly, very social. Everybody in the community knew them, everybody in the county. Between Deborah and Tommy Joe, they were liked by everyone. I don't know anybody that didn't like them. Tommy Joe was a a very friendly, happy-going, easy-going person. Deborah was also... They love people, they love to be around people, and they love to, to have a good time. What about your niece? Can you tell us something about her? I think she was also one that was very friendly. She enjoyed her friends. She uh, was expecting with her first child. She was about a month or six weeks away from, from delivering her child. She was very friendly, had lots of friends in the community. I don't know of anyone that, that disliked her. She was very happy, very joyful. Do we know who the father of her unborn child was? It was suspected that it was a a Walker, Jason Walker. To my knowledge, that's who the dad was. Is that what she believed as well? Yes, yes. I know this may be difficult, but if you can, can you kind of walk us through how you found out about the fire and ultimately the murders? It was a, a Thursday afternoon. That Thursday afternoon, I actually had a phone call from my sister, Deborah, I was outside, and one of the, my daughter, I believe, brought me the, the house phone. She had called to ask if we would be coming to uh, Easter. I believe Easter was the, not that weekend, but the following weekend, and they wanted to have a get-together at at their house, and they were staying at Tommy Joe's mother's home. And so around 6 o'clock, she had called, and we talked and had a, a great conversation. 
talked about 20 minutes and we told her or I told her that we would be coming for Easter. And then about between two and three o'clock that morning, Friday morning, I got a phone call from a uh, elderly friend that lived in Rebecca and she called the house and said that Deborah and Tom and Joe's, the house was on fire. It was Tom and Joe's mother's house said the house was on fire, but they could not find Deborah and Tom and Joe anywhere. Nobody could reach them. They tried calling and, and nobody could reach them or nobody knew where they was. When she hung up, I called my sister and told her that the house was on fire and that nobody could get a hold of Deborah and Tom and Joe. And the first thing that came to my mind was that maybe Melissa had went into labor. Maybe they had to take her to the hospital. And so I told her if she would call the hospital and call our brother who lived in Irvinville at the time, then I was going to call my father-in-law. We had three small children that were 9, 11, and 15 at that time. And so we called him and asked him if he could come over to the house because we was going to drive to Rebecca and see if we could find out what was going on or see if we could find Deborah and Tom and Joe. My sister called back and said that she had called the closest hospitals, the two or three hospitals around, and they did not have a, Melissa there, did not have her there delivering or no one was there by that night. So we drove to the house. Their house is up on an isolated drive on a country highway. But when we got there, there was a deputy sheriff at the end of the driveway. What time did you get to the site of the fire? I would say around 430. It was far enough off the road, so I couldn't tell. I knew there were a lot of uh, fire trucks up there and appeared to be a lot of police cars. But the deputy sheriff would not allow us to go up into the drive. He would not allow us to go up to the house. I asked him, I told him who I was, told him that it was my sister's house, and we were trying to find out where they were, but he would not allow us to go up into the drive. So when we left there, we went to Charles Henry's house. That was Tom and Joe's brother. We went to Charles Henry's house. He was there. We He met us at the door, and we went in and was talking to him and just asking him, did he know anything? And at that time, he told us he didn't know anything. He didn't know where they were. He didn't know anything about it. He did tell us that he had been to the house. So wait a minute. They let him in the house or to the scene, but they wouldn't let you? Apparently so. He told us that he had been there and that he had left, but they would not allow us to go up into the house. Did he say if he went there with anyone else? Uh, he did not. He didn't say if he was by himself or if anyone took him or if anybody went with him. He didn't. He did not imply that anyone had went with him at that time. He did tell us that his son was there at the house where we were now at his house. He was in the bedroom asleep, but he didn't tell us whether. He didn't say he was at the house with him. What time of day was it that you were at Charles's house? We were probably back at Charles's between 4.30 and 5. How long did you stay there? We stayed there till after lunch the following day, or right at lunch. That was a Friday. We stayed there till almost lunch. We were there about 20 minutes, maybe, and my brother, Larry Wheeler, he and his wife, they showed up at Charles's, Charles Henry's, and then maybe another 30 minutes, my sister showed up there. And by that time, it's probably around 5.30, quarter to 6 in the morning, and by that time, there were people in the community who had heard about the house fire. They were beginning to show up at the house. So by 6 o'clock, the house was pretty well full of people in the community. You mentioned that Charles' son was sleeping. Did you ever see him come out? I did not see him until probably 10 o'clock the next morning. Had you been there nonstop that whole time? I had been at the house from around four, between 4.30 and 5. We'd been there from 4.30 until... Between 11 and 12, we left and came back to our house between 11 and 12. P.M.? A.M., well, 11 a.m., Friday morning. Okay. We were there from 5 a.m., probably 4.30 a.m. to 11 or 12 a.m. And the only person you were talking with was Charles? Correct. He was the only one that came out and talked to me and my brother. And then probably around 8 o'clock, the coroner, Edgar Perry, came over to the house and told us that the bodies were in the house and that there was foul play. He did not tell us what had happened, but he said there was foul play and this was a criminal investigation at this time. What was your reaction and what was everyone else's reaction? Well, everyone was shocked and surprised. You know, you couldn't believe that something like this had happened to them. It's just going through your mind, how could this have happened? Who could have done this? There was nobody that disliked them. 
the house is far enough off the road. Within a day or two, there was all kind of theories and all kind of everybody had their different opinions and ideas about who did it or what happened. So who was present when the coroner came to deliver that news to you? Charles Henry, myself and my wife and Charles Henry's, I don't believe the son was there at that time or out when he talked to us, but there was my sister and my brother and his wife. And then there was a large number of people from the community. There was probably 20 or 30 people from the community that were there also. And he, he just kind of took us to the side in the room, but there were some other people standing around. I couldn't call their names, but there were some other people standing around when he, he told us that there was foul play. Was there anything that you felt was unusual about the time that you spent at Charles's house that morning? I don't know. It was just kind of quiet. I don't really know. I'd have to think on that question for a moment. Well, let me ask you another question. Did you ever wonder why Charles was allowed to go to the site of the fire, but you weren't? Well, I did question that. I did want to know why we couldn't go up there since it was our our sister or my, you know, I wonder why they wouldn't allow us to go up there and find out. Uh, I know it was his, his property or his family's property, but I did question, you know, why couldn't we go up there or at least wait up there until they found out something. Why was your sister and her family staying at that house at that time? They often did that. Tommy Joe's mother, Miss Joe, she lived in Fernandina and I think I don't know, but I'm pretty sure she had some valuable items in the house. I know she probably had her, her husband, or Tommy Joe's daddy, Mr. Wyman. I believe at one time, I know at one time he had a lot of guns, a lot of collectible guns, and she wanted them to stay there for to secure her home. She had some valuable items there and to help up keep the home and to show that, you know, somebody was in and out of the house. So they quite frequently would go up there and stay. They might stay up there the weekend or stay up there three or four days out of the week or sometimes two or three weeks at a time and then go back to their house in Rebecca, a couple of miles away. But they stayed because to, for security reasons for her home. So, Miss Joe, was she a full-time resident at Fernandina Beach or did she split her time or how did that work? She spent the majority of her time in Fernandina Beach, I believe, for health reasons. How I believe she it? stayed down there because of the the sea air or whatever, or she had asthma or I don't, you know, I don't know exactly, but it was some health reasons was one of the reasons she stayed down at Fernandina. Do you know where she was the night of the fire? I had thought that she was at her home in Fernandina. Now, later it came out that she may have been in the hospital, but if she was, I thought it would have been down there in Fernandina somewhere then. I did see a news report that said it actually quoted Charles Weidman, as saying that she was in the hospital the night of the fire. That's possible. I haven't, you know, heard anything to verify that, but that's possible. I know she was very sickly. I know she she passed away within a week or ten days of Tom and Joe and Deborah and Melissa's death. She passed away. So she died within a week or ten days of your sister and her family's murder. That's correct. And, and she- I believe that they did not tell her because of her health. They didn't tell her until after the funeral and after it was all over. Wait, they didn't tell Miss Joe that her family had been murdered? I think that's correct. I think that's what I had heard, that they did not tell her until it was after the funeral, if she was told then, but I, I believe it was after the funeral when she was told. Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? Let me tell you about ZipRecruiter. With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites with just one click. Then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter does not depend on candidates finding you. It finds them for you. In fact, 80% of employers, myself included, who post a job on ZipRecruiter, 
ZipRecruiter, get a quality candidate through the site within just one day. And that is something that I can personally vouch for because my most recent hire I got in just one day. There's no juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. So here's what you do, folks. Please find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's free, folks. Free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash sworn. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash sworn. Now, I've come to learn that later there was some litigation between the estate of your sister and the estate of Miss Joe. Is that correct? I'm not as familiar with that. My brother's more familiar with that part of it. I would hesitate to answer on that because I'm, I don't know enough to, to give a correct answer. Okay. Can you tell us about Miss Joe's financial circumstances? Was she well off or was she a, a person of modest means? I don't know her exact figure, but I, I, she would, I would probably consider her well off. She was a landowner and she probably had stock and things, but I know she had two or three farms in the county. You know, house in front of Dina or some property in front of Dina. So I would, you know, I would consider that more than modest. I don't know an exact figure, but I I would think it's more than modest. When was the last time your brother-in-law saw his mother? I believe him and Charles Henry had went down and visited her within a month before the murders. I don't know an exact date, but him and Charles Henry had been down there to see her. You know, I can't, like I say, I can't say an exact date, but within weeks or a month or less from the murders happening. I think you told me earlier today when we talked that some people went to visit her it just within a day or two of the murders. Who was that? I believe Charles Henry's wife and his daughter-in-law, they were there the day of the murder and maybe had went the day before. I don't know when they left to go down there, but they were not at the house. And, you know, we did ask where was Diane, his wife, and he said they were down in Fernandina. On the night of the murders, do you know if anyone was visiting Miss Joe? To my knowledge, Diane and his son's wife were visiting her or had left to go down there. I don't know when they left, but he said they were gone to Fernandina. So I don't know when they left to go, but they were gone to Fernandina to see Miss Joe. So on the night of the murders, Charles Weidman and his son were in Rebecca, but the rest of the family was in Fernandina. Is that correct? Correct. That's what I was told, or that's what Charles Henry had said, that they were gone down there. He didn't say when they left, but the night of the murders, he and his son were the only ones in town or at home. How about your sister and her family? Had anyone else gone to visit Miss Joe? I couldn't say. I know Tom and Joe and Deborah would frequently go down and visit with her and check on her. They would check on her when she would come home, but now I can't say for certain who else went down there to see her or how, or how often. Can you tell me the story that we talked about earlier today about somebody going and seeing her just before the murders and coming back with some jewelry? I was told, I thought that Tom and Joe, had, and when Charles went down there, that she had given Tom and Joe some jewelry or something. I don't know how much or what kind, but she had given him some, and he, he had brought it back home. Do you want to talk about the relationship now between your side of the family and the Weidmans? Is that something you're comfortable talking about? Not really. I, You know... I see them, and I speak with them, and they speak with me. We was at a, I was at a meeting just recently, and, and they were present at the meeting. You know, we, we speak to one another, and we occasionally run into one another in town. Does anybody ever talk to you about the murders? People come up from time to time, and they'll ask me, or they'll talk to me, and they'll give me their opinion. They'll give me their suspicions. I very seldom bring it up and very seldom talk about it or, or start or initiate the conversation, but it doesn't offend me or bother me when someone comes up and they want to talk or they want to ask or, you know, they want to express their concern. Most of the time when the sheriff comes up and publicizes the, the murders again or speaks on the in the newspaper or speaks on the local television station in Albany, you know, it'll generate some conversations and people come up and they'll talk or they'll ask or they'll tell me, you know, they're sorry about what happened and all. It did affect my family. I don't bring it up and talk about it much because I had a 9-year-old son, an 11-year-old daughter, and a 15-year-old daughter. And we didn't talk about it a whole lot because my 9-year-old and 11-year-old, for over a year, we had just built a house and we had just moved in it. 
We'd been here about a year. And for about a year, year and a half, my two youngest children slept on the floor by the bed between me and the wall. And they slept there for a year and a half because they were afraid. And even now, talking to you and bringing it up, it kind of, my wife gets a little nervous and a little scared when it's brought back up. I didn't bring it up and didn't talk about it much around them because of that. My son probably took four or five years before he would go outside by himself. If we was inside, he had to be inside. If we were outside, he had to be outside. You know, they were scared as, as young as they were. They were scared something might happen to us. Or, you know, they thought, could this happen to one of us? Or could somebody come to our house and do to us what happened to my sister? So when they were president around, we tried not to talk about it very much. Because it took a while for them to be able to go out on their own. If the door opened and my son heard it, he would run outside to see where we was going or where I was going. It would really bother him if I went to town and my wife, Vicky, she stayed at home. He would be a nervous wreck until we would all be together. He wanted everybody together. He didn't like us to be separated. So it, it took its toll on, on our family that something like this could happen in a small community like this. Were you ever interviewed by law enforcement? Yes and no. The GBI, the next day, this happened probably Friday afternoon after lunch, two or three, four o'clock in the afternoon. If you could call it that, the GBI, he did come by. He asked me to step outside. I stepped outside. We went and sat in his car. He maybe talked to me for 10 minutes. You know, at the time, you don't think about what he's doing, but I guess he was asking some questions to see, make sure that I had an alibi maybe. He asked me where was I at or what was I doing. And I told him that I had talked to Deborah at 6 o'clock that afternoon, and then I told him about the phone call in the middle of the night and that my wife and I, we went to Rebecca, and then we was at Charles Henry's house, and that was all the questions he asked me. He never talked to my wife. He never talked to my kids. He never talked to anybody else to verify my story. So the GBI never verified your alibi? They never talked to uh, any other, none of my, my wife or my children. They never talked to them. To, you know, he never talked to her to say, was this what happened? He never come back and talked to me. I haven't heard from him since that day. He talked to me 10 minutes in his car, and I told him about her calling me at 6 o'clock. I told him about us leaving in the middle of the night and going over there, my wife and I. And I asked him when I finished telling him that, I asked him, did he think they could solve the case? And he said, yes, every case, is, this case is solvable. Did and he- so I was left with a feeling that, okay, they got enough information somewhere that they will be able to solve this in a short time or a reasonable time. And after that day, the GBI, nobody's ever contacted me. I think they may have. I know my sister and my brother have called them, but they've never called me or told me, you know, we're still working on this or we've got some leads or is there anything else you can tell me? You've asked me more questions than they've asked me. Did they record the conversation that took place in the car? Not to my knowledge. If he did, he didn't tell me, but not to my knowledge. He took maybe a few notes, but he, to my knowledge, he didn't record anything. Do you know if he talked to anyone on the Weidman side of the family? I don't know. He didn't tell me. He didn't ask or he didn't elaborate. I might have been in the car 10 minutes with him, and I've told you or you've asked more than he asked me. Did anybody ever tell you how they were murdered? Not directly. That Friday night, because it was large families— Tom and Joe's family was large, and they were in Rebecca, and then we lived on this end of the county. My brother lived in another county. My sister lived in town. So at that time, for no, you know, no reason other than the fact that we, you know, both had large families and lots of friends, and also we agreed that that some of the people can meet at, at my house, and some of the people can meet at Charles Henry's house. So we met here, and that night, Friday night, the district attorney, our district attorney is in another county. He's from Tifton. And the district attorney came over to the house, and we went upstairs, me, my sister, and my brother, and I, I believe the sheriff was here. And we went up into a room, and he told us that you know they had been murdered. He told us they had been shot, but he didn't give us any other details more than that. that it was a murder case that they felt like that some arson was involved in and, and that they were shot. He didn't tell us where. He didn't tell us with what or nothing like that. You know, I didn't have a problem with that. But that's all the information. The only other information I've gotten is, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there. You hear from someone, people talk that were involved in it. Has anyone in law enforcement ever told you what kind of gun was used? No. Has anyone in law enforcement ever told you where your sister was shot? 
No. Has anyone in law enforcement ever told anybody you know either of those things? I couldn't say. People have commented that, you know, and I don't know if it's their opinion or if they have heard it from some law enforcement. People have commented where they might have been shot. I know finally I wasn't allowed to go up the night of the murder and when the fire, they were still putting out the fire. But three or four days later, within a week, we were allowed to go up to the house. They said that they had done all the investigating they needed to do, and so we were allowed to go up to the house. And you can tell where they had sifted through the ash and everything. And I questioned one of the the law enforcement about, you know, why was this area sifted through more than other areas? Was that where the bodies might have been? And he said, well, that was left there for y'all's benefit. I'm sorry, say that again? When we went into the house, the house was burnt down, and there was nothing but rubble and ash, and you could walk through What was left, this was about a week after the murder. They did say the wires were cut. I did either law enforcement or some of the firemen that got there said that the telephone wires had been cut to the house. They do know that. I did hear that from some from an official. I couldn't say which one. But we were allowed to go up to the house. And so my brother, my sister, and some others, we went to the house. And I did question why did they allow us to go up there so soon, or I thought was soon after the murder. Because I thought maybe they would want more time for themselves to check and see if I could find any clues. But we were allowed to go up there. And you could tell some areas where it looked like maybe they had sifted through the the rubble and the ashes more. And so I asked a law official, was that where they were when they were, were shot? And he said that he didn't come out and say yes. He said, well, that was left there for y'all's benefit. What did you interpret that to mean? I thought that meant that's where they were they were laying. I don't know why they would want us to see where they were laying, but I thought that's that was his way of saying yes without telling me yes. So if that's the case, can you describe for us where the individuals were laying? I think one was probably in a living room, one was in a hall, and one was in the, the doorway of a bedroom. None of this was at the front door. It was all in the interior of the house. Correct. I had been in the house before. I'd, when Deborah and Tom and Joe were staying there, I had been by the house a time or two and been inside the house. So one area appeared to be what was the uh, den or living room. One area was in what was a hall. The house, you know, you had a hall. You go down to the, the three bedrooms. One was area where the ashes were set. It looked like it was in the hall. And one appeared to be in the doorway. So basically the law enforcement officers on the scene without telling you directly, they were letting you know that the bodies were located inside the house. Well, they weren't there when we went. There were no law officers there at the house when we went. We were just told we could go and visit the site if we wanted to. Oh, okay. But a law enforcement official did tell you that those... Right. Okay, that was a later time. So, right. So basically, law enforcement told you that the shootings took place inside the residence. They didn't tell me that, but they led me to believe that by what, telling me that we, when I asked the question, was that where the bodies were, then you hate to assume, but that's what you assumed they were allowing you to know. That's what you took away from it. That it happened inside, but the bodies were found inside. Law enforcement told you that the telephone wire was cut to the residence? I don't know if it was a law enforcement or one of the firefighters, but, but one of the officials that was there when they were putting out the fire, whether it was a fireman or whether it was a or volunteer fireman or one of the law officers, I don't remember which one, but we were told that the phone wires had been cut. I couldn't say who, but I was also told, I asked, I did ask a question, I don't remember what, law officer or whatever, but the door was not locked. And so I know Tom and Joe would not have opened the door to a total stranger in the middle of the night. When I asked one of the firemen, I did ask the question, was the doors locked? And he said no. So we've got a cut telephone line and an unlocked door and bodies located inside the residence. That's the information that I've gathered from different ones that were the responders that were there at the fire, from different responders over time. I didn't get all those answers from the same person, but over time, different ones that I had talked to that were there was a, a volunteer fireman or whether it was a law officer, those are some things that that were told. 
you mentioned that your sister and some others from time to time have contacted the GBI about this case. Do you know if the GBI has told them anything? I do not. They, you know, we would talk some. We don't, you know, every time I hear something, I don't call them because a lot of it's hearsay. And anytime you talk to somebody, some of it's something they've heard from two or three other sources. So I don't call them every time I hear something. They don't call me every time that they hear something. But, you know, we have, we do communicate, but I don't know. I couldn't tell you what all the GBI has told them. Do you have I know the, that they have not contacted me and told me anything. Do you have the impression that anybody is really still working on this case or is it your belief that it's probably gathering dust on the files gathering dust somewhere? Sometimes I feel like it's gathering dust because I haven't heard anything from the GBI, so I don't know. I don't know if there's any pressure put on them. They weren't politically involved, or sometimes I feel that way. And, and I don't blame. We've had, you know, now we're on our third sheriff that's been elected. We had a sheriff that was in from for a short time between elections. We're on our fourth sheriff, and by now, you know, it grows cold. And, and I know the lead investigator that was on... Uh, working with the sheriff's department when the murder happened he no longer works with the sheriff's department so i don't know what you don't know what theories he had you don't know what suspicions he had you don't know what evidence he had somebody else you know they come in i don't know how much of that he passed along i don't know what theories he might have had that he could have been working on so you, you know you have to question well is it getting cold the present sheriff i have talked to and he has talked to me and he has communicated with me he told me one time not long ago that he had communicated with the GBI and was wanting them to get maybe a different set of eyes looking at the evidence to see if you know someone else maybe could pick up or see something that the original investigators might not see. Is there anything else that you think is important that we haven't talked about that I've missed that you think might be important? I just want someone, to, you know, just to keep asking questions and, and keep it current because sooner or later, you know, maybe somebody will say something, somebody will remember something. People have a tendency either if someone that didn't have a conscience at all, they're either going to brag about it or if someone has a conscience, they're going to feel guilty and want to tell someone maybe to get forgiveness. So one of the two, either they're going to brag about doing it and not getting caught or either they're going to want someone to forgive them because their conscience is bothering them. But either way, they're going to talk to somebody somewhere sometime. And so we have to keep it going and keep it current so that that person that hears that vital information will come forward with it. Well, what I can tell you is that we've recently come across some information that somebody claims to know quite a bit about the specific facts of this case. And we've passed that on to the GBI. Now, what they do with it, I don't know. But what I can tell you is that we've come across some information that has the potential to solve this case, and we passed it on to the GBI very recently. Well, I am very grateful. I'm very thankful for what you're doing. I am thankful that you took interest in it and that you're bringing it back to light because that keeps people talking, and it keeps it fresh on other people's mind. And each time we did elect a sheriff, they would come, and, and they would ask for my vote, and I would ask them to treat the case as though it was one of their relatives, meaning that I wouldn't want them to just put it in a box and let it collect dust, but to keep digging at it until they found somebody. After speaking with David Wheeler, I thought more about what I had heard, and I reached back out to clarify just a couple of details. I wanted to know more about the scene at Charles Henry's house the morning of the fire. David wrote to me, when we arrived at Charles Henry and Diane's home, Charles Henry told us Chip was there. So just to keep things straight here, Chip Weidman is Charles Henry's adult son, who was married at the time and did not live at his parents' house. David goes on to say he was told Chip had taken a bath and gone to bed. That conversation took place at approximately 4 to 4.30 a.m. We did not see Chip until close to lunch on Friday. To my knowledge, Charles Henry voluntarily told us about Chip. We never asked where he was. David also clarified that according to what he was told at the time of the fire, Diane Weidman was in Florida, along with her son Chip's wife, visiting Miss Joe, and that they had been there since the day before the fire, which would have been Thursday. 
We've actually been looking at the Weidman murders for quite some time now. You see, when Payne Lindsay, host of our sister podcast, Up and Vanished, was in South Georgia investigating the disappearance of Irwin County history teacher and beauty queen Tara Grinstead, someone told Payne some very compelling information about the Weidman murders in nearby Rebecca, Georgia. Later, however, when we tried to follow up with this person, he didn't have anything to say except for calling us swine. Nevertheless, we were able to independently corroborate much of what the caller had initially said the first time. We were able to corroborate that his ex-son-in-law did, in fact, die in a car crash. And we were able to corroborate that a close relative of the Weidman murder victims was a pallbearer at the funeral following that car crash. So why the change of heart on behalf of this caller? That's anyone's guess at this point. But this person's purported knowledge of the case could well be the key to finally solving the Weidman murder case after 15 long years. Just by talking to the community, asking questions, and looking at publicly available information, we've learned quite a bit about this unsolved triple murder. I wonder what would be possible if the GBI or even someone like John Dawes were to really put their shoulder into this. What else might they learn if they redoubled their efforts with the full investigative capabilities of the state of Georgia? Now, it's important to understand, we're not accusing anyone of anything. But in addition to the phone call that we turned over to the GBI, which frankly, in my opinion, has the potential to solve this case entirely, we did come across something else that we found interesting and, at a minimum, quite odd. Remember, Tommy Joe and Deborah Weidman had a nephew, Charles Weidman III, also known as Chip Weidman. According to David Wheeler, Chip and his father Charles were the only ones at Charles Weidman's home on the morning of the murders. He also mentioned that Chip wasn't really anywhere to be seen in the immediate aftermath of the fire. I don't know what this means, and we're not accusing anyone of anything, but one thing on Chip's Facebook page at the time of this recording really caught our attention It's what is listed as his favorite quote. It says, three can keep a secret if two are dead. We'll continue to follow this case in the future and plan to come out with more episodes in a few months. So please, if you have any information at all about this case, contact the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. You can also contact us directly at sworntips at gmail.com. Sworn is produced by Tenderfoot TV in Atlanta. Story and production by Payne Lindsay, Mason Lindsay, and Meredith Stedman, and myself, Philip Holloway. Sound design by Payne Lindsay. Executive producers, Donald Albright and Payne Lindsay. Mixed and mastered by Resonate Recordings. Also, if you haven't yet, Please check out our sister podcast, Up and Vanished, that follows the investigation into the disappearance of Georgia high school teacher and beauty queen, Tara Grinstead. Up and Vanished is available now on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. This is Philip Holloway, and I'll see you next time on Sworn. New episodes of Sworn will be available seven days early on TuneIn. Download the TuneIn app and listen for free. Hear new shows from other great podcasts on TuneIn before anywhere else. You can find our new episodes at TuneIn.com slash Sworn. That's TuneIn.com backslash Sworn.